everybody, it's Drags, and it's July 11th, and time for episode 253 of Patriot Speed on the CLNS Media Network. Today, I want to introduce Evan Valenti of WBRK in Pittsfield, Mass., and also a very valuable part of our CLNS media team. He knows his football, and he knows his Patriots, and this is a great time to get to know Evan. Evan, welcome. Hey, what's up, man? It's, it's kind of funny for me, usually, normally... So the way to I'm interviewing you. This is the first time I think you've interviewed me. This is kind of a treat for me. This is fun. Well, see, I like to return the favor, and I like to spread the wealth. That's what I like to do in the sports media Appreciate business. That. You know why that is, Evan? <laughs> you know why that is? Why? Because we all need each it. other. That's true. <laughs> That's true. And, and given the uh, no, volatility sure. of the sports media market all around us, I, I think you know it. We're uh, we're talking about oh, there. Absolutely. Well, uh, oh, yeah. it's been um, here. Here's a segue. It's been kind of a volatile off season for the New England Patriots. And uh, today I want to spend some time in episode 253 talking about three reasons we think it'll be business as usual for the Patriots in 2018 and maybe three reasons it won't. And I'll get things rolling here uh, with three reasons. It'll be business as usual for the New England Patriots and why I think uh, they're probably going to win 12 games again and be the number two seed, uh, at least in the AFC, uh, AFC uh, with a buy uh, come the playoffs. And that's Tom Brady in the offense. You could make the argument, Evan. Given the additions of people like uh, Jordan Matthews and certainly a rookie like Sony Michelle, uh, and you take a look at what's coming back, Chris Hogan um, and James White uh, and Rob Gronkowski, the offense is going to be fine. I uh, so yeah, my number one reason is obviously Tom Brady. It's funny though. Um, part of one of my reasons for not believing that this is going to be business as usual has to do with the offense. So I'll say that for later. But when you have Tom Brady, you have Rob Gronkowski, eventually you have Julian Edelman back. Um, you know, Dante Skarnecchia coaching up the offensive line with a new addition like Isaiah Wynn. I agree. I think business as usual for the Patriots offensively. Now, it will take a while maybe to get a little footing. Sure. We saw that last year with the first four games. The Patriots got off to kind of a rocky start. Then all of a sudden, things started to click around week five. We had that game against Tampa Bay on a Thursday night where everybody was like, oh, this is kind of a short week. This could be rough. Right, right after that, they picked things up. It was back to normal. Uh, that's, you know, the Pats like to use those first four weeks in September as more of a, you know, extended, uh, training camp and extended, extended preseason, if you will, working things out, seeing who fits where. Um, but this offense has been, I don't know, since 07, just been on on another level, another machine, so to speak. You know, there aren't too many offenses out there that can kind of generate the type of, uh, uh, of high end uh, of talent that the Patriots can, and in in you look at over the past decade, what this team has been known for recently, it's all offense. It's all Tom Brady. As long as he has Rob Gronkowski, who as Michael Lombardi calls a Tuesday player, a guy you think about on Tuesday, how to stop him on Sunday, and when you add Edelman back to the fold, I mean, it's just too many good players. James White is a, is a real solid guy, but I'm really excited for Sony Michelle. I thought they would draft him. Right when after the, the the interview came out, quote unquote, they had him in for an interview. I was like, that's interesting because it seems like a Bill Belichick type of guy. Um, and, and the other guys they brought on are exciting, but I, I'll I'll temper that uh, for the next one. Again, Brady is my number one on this track. Number two, they still have Bill Belichick as their head coach. He is yep. the best head coach in the league by a mile. Doug Peterson did a great job, had a great game plan in the Super Bowl uh, for Philadelphia. But it does not detract from the fact that. You know, Bell Belichick's still the best coach in the league by a wide margin. So with Belichick in the fold, with Brady in the fold still, I still think this team has all the tools they really need to be successful. Um, and, and bringing back uh, Josh McDaniels, to you know, if you want to add to the offensive kind of new any Mike, you can still stay there for sure. Well, and um, I have Bill Belichick still being in total control and command of the situation down in Foxborough. You and I are um, in total agreement there. I do think... Um, once uh, the rhythm of camp gets started and the preseason gets started, I think Belichick will have things uh, in order down there, and there's no reason to believe otherwise. He looks relaxed and comfortable on all of his uh, Instagram uh, <laughs> uh, posts with yeah. uh, Linda Holiday with his girlfriend. So uh, Nantucket is yeah. treating him well. He comes back refreshed, as he sure. usually does. There's no reason to think uh, that Belichick's fire has diminished uh, whatsoever. I'm going to give you the number three, um, my number three. Sure. And that would be 
defensively, I think Dante Hightower returns with a rejuvenated defense. And a this is very important, very important, Evan, a no-nonsense, well-respected Brian Flores who takes over for Matt Patricia, you know, who is the ipso facto uh, defensive coordinator. I don't think enough people have spent time talking about Brian Flores and how respected he is in that locker room and what that will mean to this defense. I, I again, we're gonna we're gonna somewhat agree here, right? Because there's part of the defense I don't like uh, that has me concerned for 2018, 2019. And there's there's things I do like. I think going into the off season, the Patriots looked at some things they desperately needed after that Super Bowl. They needed a pass rush and they needed some help at cornerback. I mean, not having about Mal- well, the Malcolm Butler saga will continue to linger over this franchise until they win the next Super Bowl, and then and then, then everybody will get over it, right? But in terms of adding depth where they needed some depth, pass rush, obviously bringing Adrian Claiborne is turning heads, uh, so to speak, in the early parts of training camp. Again, I'm not down there, so I've not seen this with my own eyes, but if you read things from guys all over the beat, you're hearing Adrian Claiborne is starting to impress. That's big. But the Patriots in that Super Bowl game, clear, uh, so glaringly obvious that they didn't have a pass rush. They missed a guy like Dietrich Wise, who potentially can help them out. Uh, they obviously bring in Claiborne's going to be nice. They bring in Danny Shelton um, as more of a defensive tackle, run stopper type of guy, but that's going to free up other guys to get after the quarterback. I like that they went out and added that, uh, and, and especially Claiborne, who's a nice vet who fits in nice there. Been in big games, of course, with Atlanta in the Super Bowl. I also like in the back end, they add uh, not just Devin McCourty. But I kind of like the Duke, Duke Dawson edition. I mean, I, I didn't know who this guy was. A lot of people which made did. The perfect Evan? Patriots. I did not know. We were doing a we we're doing a live show. I'm doing a live show with Alex Barth and Evan Lazar, of Sports Illustrated, and we're sitting there, and they pick Duke Dawson, and you know they come to me for my live take of Duke Dawson. <laughs> like, guys, I'm not gonna lie. I don't know who this guy is. So. Let's go off just some things that I know about Bill Belichick. He loves slot cornerbacks, you know, between Kyle Arrington. He went Ross Dowling a couple of years ago out of Virginia Tech, trying to, or Virginia, trying to bring in guys uh, to fill this particular spot. Uh, I like the fact they try to address this. I mean, in the in the Super Bowl, the, uh, nobody could cover inside the slot. It was glaringly obvious. You get a guy like Dawson who had a decent, you know, uh, track record at, at Florida in that spot. Obviously, bringing in the other McCourty brothers is going to be nice. And all the new jokes we can get and all the twin switches we can get, it's going to at least be entertaining with, with both D-Mac and Jason you know, in the same locker room in, 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 during the season. So if you're looking for a bright side in terms of covering the team, maybe there can be some interest level there and entertainment level there for sure. Well, I think you know another player that uh, we're going to learn something about is Derek Rivers. Because remember, he missed all of yeah. last year. And... You know, he is somebody else who could add a lot of depth uh, as an outside backer, you know, an edge player. Uh, he's only 23, had a great rep out of Youngstown State. And, you know, you throw him into the mix, uh, somebody they, you know, regard very highly. You know, he was a third-round pick in 2017. You throw uh, Derek Rivers into the mix along with uh, the aforementioned Adrian Claiborne, who is coming off a career year, um, and Dietrich Wise. And the player who I think is going to have a breakout year for this defense is Trey Flowers. I think he is uh, capable of having a first-team um, all pro selection type of season for the Patriots. And I frankly, th- he, he needs to That's have a that. hot take. Well, I mean, if you take a close look at his progression, um, Evan, yeah, and he's, talk he's. to people like Mike Lombardi, they absolutely love Trey flowers. His motor is solid. He is a good kid. He is very bright, uh, and he can go forever. And if he stays healthy, you could make the argument Trey Flowers is the single most important player on that defense, perhaps even more important than Dante Hightower. I am a huge, huge fan of Trey Flowers. Uh, I I mean, you know, the proof's in the pudding here. He's always kind of showed up on tape as a guy that kind of jumps off the screen, you know, more gradually as, as you know, he's gotten you know older in his NFL career. Um, I I share excitement with you on that. I'm not going to go out here and say it's going to be a first-team All-Pro type of guy. That'd be great. Don't get me wrong. I think it's going to be fantastic if it ends up going that way. Um, but they do need a guy that that can at least give them consistent production in that in that spot. And he seems to, along with Claiborne, seems to be the most logical guy for that. But I, you know, look at this defense: pass rush upgraded. Hopefully, 
and when if everybody can stay healthy and intact. And on the back end, I think they upgraded as well. Now the middle is where I get a little yeah. iffy. And you bring up High Tower, right? And that's one of the things that I think that can hold them back. They don't really have a ton of depth at the linebacker position. Uh, you know, they didn't really have it last year. They don't really have it again this year. And High Tower spot specifically. I mean, last year you're looking at guys like David Harris coming in and trying to fill that spot, and didn't do it nearly as good as anybody else has done it. Um, you know, Atlanta Roberts will come in and try and spell Dante High Tower. You, t- you talk about the drop off from High Tower to the next guy, and with High Tower's injury prone, you know, problems. You know, and, and look, him playing through what he played through in the Seattle game and, the, and that Super Bowl is is unbelievable, right? And you can see the impact of a guy like Dante Hightower when he's healthy, fully sure. engaged. They are a completely different defensive team. But my my big problem, my big fear is, you know, Hightower has been, you know, nicked up in the past. And it's kind of the – it's what happens when you play football. But uh, the fact that they don't have another guy behind him that can even relatively carry the slack, Mike, for me is one of the biggest concerns. Well, I, and I got to tell you, um, I don't think – the Patriots and Belichick and company regard the linebacker position as a serious issue of weakness for the simple reason. I think they're going to go more and more with big nickel, um, six corners, um, or play with a hybrid linebacker safety type of uh, situation. And Belichick loves his secondary. And I think for that reason, you're going to see a lot of instances, and he even did toward the end of last year, where you had two linebackers on the field and you go with uh, six uh, defensive backs and leave it at that. Um, you know, Kyle Van Noy is a very versatile, uh, if not spectacular, uh, linebacker, and I think you know he's very well respected, very intelligent. So I think he's got a spot on this team along with High Tower. Uh, then you get into the depth, and you wonder, you know, who's going to be the third and fourth linebackers on the depth chart? Who's going to play strong and weak side? Uh, and you wonder about a Landon Roberts, Marquise Flowers, and the two rookies, Christian Sam and uh, Juwan Bentley. Uh, those. I think the linebacker situation shapes up as uh, one of those big questions that will come out of training camp and we'll get a lot more clarity once, um, you know, they put the pads on and once the preseason games uh, begin, we'll get an idea of where the team views of the linebacker position because you really don't know until you see them on the field. Um, and certainly I don't think, you know, Belichick's lying when he says they, the coaches don't even know until they see them on the field in pads um, right. how – uh, this linebacking group is going to come together. But I think Belichick feels like um, if his front four uh, and his defensive line and his secondary are good, then the, the linebackers can be you know, serviceable uh, and effective, and that's all they need from them. Yeah, again, this the depth thing is what concerns me. But I mean, if Hightower and Van Noy are going to play most of the season, then you're fine. And you're and again, actually, those are two very good options. It's not like those aren't great options. It's just you know what happens when Hightower gets hurt again is always something you got to think about. And it's usually something that Belichick normally has like good depth at every single position. You know, you look at like if you look at the the offensive line position the past couple of years, and they've been able to plug guys in here and there right. all over the place. Part of that is Dante Skarniecki being the best offensive line coach in the league. Part of that is Belichick building his roster with the first little guys that can spell guys at right guard and then left tackle and then come back and play right guard again. Like that's that's part of the way they build their team. That's what makes a guy like Isaiah Wynn so intriguing. It's like, where does he even play? He could Because he, he can play left guard. He showed that at Georgia. He's a really good player there. He can kick inside. He can kick to the other side. I mean, he's just – that's the type of guy they look for – all over the place, and I feel like at linebacker, it's harder to kind of do that. They have a bunch of guys that can put their hand in the dirt as an edge player or play back at the linebacker level. But, again, you don't really have true linebackers, especially in that middle spot if Hightower goes down. Speaking with Evan Valenti of WBRK in Pittsfield, Mass., and also an important part of our Patriots team at clnsmedia.com. Everyone, I want to tell you about a new wellness brand for men. It's called Four Hymns. There's a problem out there. 66% of men lose their hair by the age of 35. Thing is, when you start to notice hair loss, guys, you know this, it's just too late. It's always easier to keep the hair you have than to replace the hair you've lost. Is that hairline very slowly starting to move backwards? How will you feel a year from now if it's business as usual up top? I ask you, do you want a bald spot to pop up? 
or do you want to do something about it first? Well, there is a solution. It's called 4 What is 4 It's a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men. Thanks to science, baldness can now be optional. Hims connects you with real doctors and medical-grade solutions to treat hair loss. There's well-known generic equivalents to name-brand prescriptions to help you keep your hair. There's no snake oil pills or gas station counter supplements. And prescription solutions are backed by science. Order now. My listeners get a trial month of Hims for just $5 today right now while supplies last. See the website for full details. This would cost you hundreds if you went to the doctor or a pharmacy. Go to 4 slash trags. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash T-R-A-G-S. 4 slash trags. Speaking again with Evan Valenti of WBRK in Pittsfield, Mass., and also part of our Patriots team at clnsmedia.com. Evan, it's hard to believe that in just 15 days the Patriots will be reporting for summer training camp down at Foxborough outside Gillette Stadium. The off season has gone by so very quickly, and unfortunately for a lot of Patriots fans and those who cover the team, including yours truly, there's been a lot of unwanted drama. I'm not a big fan of drama. I know it's what really uh, drives the meter in some parts of social media and whatnot. I get that. But you know, one of the reasons that I think um, it won't be business as usual down at Foxborough this year is there are questions that surround Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski's focus and commitment that, frankly, haven't been there before. And that may all come uh, change come camp, but truth is, Brady didn't take snaps with the new players and OTAs, and will that impact timing and the learning curve? What do you think? So, I, uh, so this is the big, big story everybody's talking about, and I, you know, frankly something that the Patriots haven't dealt with really the entire run. This is It feels like the Pats and the Spurs, the San Antonio Spurs of the NBA, right, are in a similar footing here. You have the Kawhi drama with the Spurs. What do they do with him? What's going on? Why Why have you heard anything about his injuries? And this is something you haven't heard about San Antonio like ever during the Greg Popovich era. Same thing here with the Patriots. I mean, the whole – and it's just annoying, really, because you're not really getting any answers until you know you get you hear from Gronk. Oh, he's coming back. He's not going to retire. They're not trading him. I mean, remember that? It was crazy that one day on just on Twitter, people going on Reddit, uh, trying to figure out coding on Reddit to figure out if if they know when this next story is going to. It was it was unbelievable. It was stupid. It was, it was I silly. Spent so much stupid time on the internet on my phone trying to figure out if Rob Gronk is going to get traded. I'm not worried about Brady because. Brady's the consummate professional, and after so many years being in the league, I think Brady has earned a little bit of, okay, maybe he can relax for a minute and, and spend some more time in Montana with his family before he comes back to New England. I don't have a problem with that. Um, the Gronkowski thing, look, they treat him with kid gloves anyway when it comes to you know the, the, the preseason stuff. Like He doesn't play in the preseason anymore. Um, it's more about getting Rob Gronkowski healthy and in shape for week one, and however that happens – I really don't care to the point right. where you know these guys know their bodies. They know exactly what they need to do to get ready, get in shape. Do I want them with the team when when things start? Absolutely. Do I need them to do all the stuff like all the OTA stuff, all the voluntary mini camps and stuff? Not really. Not for Brady, who's 41 years old. If Brady wants to take a little extra time and spend it with Giselle and spend it with his kids, I'm fine with that. Not a big deal. It just seems like every single week we're going to hear about Alex Guerrero. We're going to hear about all the – the problems they have with the training staff and how there's two voices, three voices, four voices trying to get all their, you know, the words and edgewise and Belichick trying to manage that. That's, you know, my biggest concern is like, and it's never been a problem, but the off the field distraction of this story that's lingered on for a year plus now is going to be something they have to deal with. And the fact that nobody's been able to come out and address it uh, head on. Eve just makes it more complicated. And, and you know the Boston news cycle, Mike. You know it better than most people do. How, you know, EEI and 98.5 will eat all that stuff up and just drag this stuff out into oblivion. You read my mind because part of this story is the media's desire to get a controversy out of the Patriots. You know, the Patriots are 
absolute media relations pros when it comes to stuff like this. They they identify the problem, they come up with a strategic plan quickly, and it never blossoms into anything other than an annoyance. And they know that in the social media um, age that we live in, there are going to be annoyances. It just so happens that this off season there have been more of those that have happened um, than at any time I think in the Belichick era and they've been I think a little bit more serious um, than in the past uh, and it all started with Malcolm Butler and Super Bowl 52. I I think when you talk about what really drove to the core of the um, unity of the Patriots and, and whether or not uh, there is some significant division inside that locker room, what happened with Malcolm Butler and Super Bowl 52? I think I think really spoke to that and like who's in charge why is Bill really doing this and those questions really have never been answered but you know Belichick in his own way just lets it die out and says you know it's my personal decision and we move on I think with uh, Rob Gronkowski Evan you take a close look at the situation I do think there are offers on the table from Tennessee and San Francisco but I think the Patriots and and well before um you know, that uh, episode with Reddit, I think it happened, you know, right around the draft. And I do believe that there, there were, there was interest and even an offer on the table. Uh, But in, in the end, the Patriots wound up not pulling the trigger. Well, if you're in a trade, Rob Gronkowski, the the big question is how, what do you get back for that? And I don't know if you could ever get actual good value back for that, because I mean, again, Gronk is one of the best players on the field. Every time he takes the field, doesn't matter. So, um, and he's such a game breaker, and, and you talk about unity. I thought I like, it's funny. The one thing about unity that I think is interesting. Normally, when you get you know any controversy out of the Patriots, the story usually remains the same with everybody in the locker room. It's usually the same exact story. The one thing about the the Butler thing is you haven't gotten the same story from everybody. It's been a little different. You know, you hear from certain guys in the locker room. Oh yeah, you know uh, he wasn't playing well during uh, the practices anyway. We kind of saw this coming. Meanwhile, other guys were kind of blindsided by it. So again, that unity thing. Not getting the same story out of everybody is very interesting. I'll give you my last, as we kind of did the the off the field stuff. Uh, the linebacking depth is a problem for me in terms of why it might not be business as usual. And I'll give you, I guess, the the, the hot take that I have um, in comparison to other because I've seen a lot of people say that the Patriots have good wide receiver depth, and I don't, and I don't have that same same thing. I don't. I think the the wide receiver position is a little murky. Um, and I don't think a lot of people are talking about this enough because I, I like look Edelman not being there for four games stinks. He's coming off an ACL injury. Uh, he hopefully comes back 100. percent We don't know With that injury now. We're a little bit better in terms of of handling that. Uh, you know, uh, getting guys into rehab at the right time. You guys come back from the injury all the time now, so maybe it's not a big deal. But losing Brandon Cooks, look, I know a lot of people didn't like Brandon Cooks. He still had a thousand yards and seven touchdowns. He was a very productive player. I know people were like, "Oh, he's going to be Randy Moss." He wasn't. Okay, not a big deal. But he was productive enough in that system to make it work. But losing Amendola, I'm not quite sure where they make that up. Like, I like Chris Hogan a lot. He's a great player, incredible athlete. Uh, really stretches the field for them. But I, he doesn't really give you the same. Um, uh, he's had the same chemistry with Brady that Amendola had, and it doesn't. And we don't know if he can be as clutch yet. I mean, Amendola, people forget uh, in that Super Bowl against Atlanta was super clutch against Seattle. Again, had a couple of big catches yep. for touchdowns in the end of that game. Uh, and you saw him against Tennessee, tear up Tennessee all over the field against Jacksonville, all over the field. He was amazing. I'm not sure if they have the guy on that roster that can make up for his production. Like Jordan Mathis is a nice player. Uh, is a guy that had some catching the ball issues early on in his career. Seems to have overcome that, but we don't know how he's going to fit in the system. Um, Malcolm Mitchell, another guy that people forget about in that Atlanta Super Bowl that had a couple of really unbelievable catches, including one on the left side of the field where he fell down, got back up, caught it for a first down, and then fell back down again. Like Malcolm Mitchell's a, a, a great talent and, in theory, makes a lot of sense. But again, a guy that has injury problems, and again, we don't know throw a full, full seats and how he connects with Tom Brady. I like Braxton Berrios out of Miami. He seems like the complete Patriots player, but we haven't seen him take a single snap with Brady yet. So, again, there for me, at that position, I think outside of Gronk and Edelman and, again, Hogan, 
I think you have a lot of question marks, especially depth-wise, if anybody gets hurt there. Philip Dorsett and Riley McCarron, we're going to learn a lot about those two, I think. I mean, obviously, we are, we've we already seen Philip Dorsett, and he's had his moments. He's flashed some signs of brilliance uh, for the Patriots in the receiving game. Uh, but again, it's consistency, like you mentioned, and we got you have to see it week in and week out. Uh, if you're going to be one of Brady's reliable targets, right? So that gets to one of my other reasons where I don't think it'll be business as usual, and that's because Tom Brady has always prided himself on working uh, in OTAs and uh, taking snaps and really getting the newer players up to speed. We don't. He didn't have that this year, and I think that's a big deal. And I think silently a lot of people down in Foxborough uh, have indicated uh, to me and others that that is uh, an unknown, an uncertainty regarding the offense and whether or not Brady is going to click with these guys because we have seen it before where Brady, where receivers are brought in and they are expected uh, to do very, very well and all of a sudden they don't and they don't click right away. We saw it with Brandon Cooks initially until he started to really catch on. Uh, The other points I want to get to, um, Evan, is the uncertainty around the offensive line, starting with the effort to replace Nate Solder. We're going to wrap it up here. Um, But I think this is a fascinating storyline to follow. And I think it's going to be Trent Brown uh, who gets the start at left tackle uh, instead of Adrian Waddle. But certainly Waddle and Trent Brown are going to compete there. Um, I think, you know, certainly there's been talk of Isaiah Wynn getting a look-see from Dante Skarnecchia, uh, the offensive line coach. Um, so those three players are in the mix at uh, left tackle. Certainly Marcus Cannon is going to stay at right tackle. They're not moving him out of a position uh, that he's most comfortable in. So that's the way I see the offensive line but filling in that void for Nate Solder that's a big one to me it is a big one there's no question about it but then you know I always come back to Dante's amazing and he'll figure it out because he's he's an incredible guy like I remember people were talking about the Isaiah Wynn pick and like people like what what is this this guy doesn't play left tackle or left guard what does he really play and somebody I think it was it might ah, I forget who it was but somebody was had put out there um, if Dante Scarnecchia likes this pick, trust me, it was the right pick. You know what I mean? I, what I, look, is that, a, is that a big question mark? Sure. And Trent Brown, we don't know. He's a big body. I mean, you, you saw the picture of him and Mike Reese together. It's almost laughable to see those two guys on uh, the same field at the same time. And as, as a guy that's as about Mike Reese's height, I can sympathize with Mike, no doubt about it. Uh, but – uh, to, there is a question mark, no question. And, and Nate Solder was a great guy to have in the locker room, and, and it was a great presence, very steady presence for Tom Brady. Um, for the most part, reliable, somewhat of an injury history, but you, you have some – again, that's the one thing with Belichick, how he builds that offensive line is there's usually depth at every spot. Guys that can play in multiple spots are guys that Belichick really likes. So they're going to at least have answers, like we're going to try this guy, we'll try this guy. And if that doesn't work, maybe we'll give Isaiah a win that spot. Like Again, they have answers there. And you look at the rest of the offensive line, it still looks pretty intact. I mean, Marcus Cannon was fantastic last year at right tackle. You still have Shaq Mason as a guy that grades out extremely well. Um, you know, Joe Tooney last year was a little up and down, but they still have a great offensive line. That's the big – and for me, it's not – for. it's more about – the guys in the interior more than the exterior for me because Bray does a great job sliding up into his protection and buying himself some time that way. The best way to beat these guys, whether it's Brady or Breeze or, and, 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 and maybe not to this extent, but Matt Ryan, guys that are pocket, quote, unquote, pocket passers, the best way to beat them is with pressure in their face and the A and B gaps. And the way the Patriots run their offense – Quick hitting, you know, short intermediate routes with their wide receivers. I don't worry about the edges as much anymore. As long as their interior holds up, they're going to be just fine. But again, that left tackle spot's so important, and to bring in a bunch of bring in Brown and to maybe throw Waddle over there, and with Isaiah winning the fold, yeah, that's a decent question mark. I'll give you that. Evan Valenti of WBRK in Pittsfield, Mass. Evan, how can people follow you on social media and online? So you can find me uh, on my Twitter handle, since my namesake, E-V-A-N-V-A-L-E-N-T-I. Uh, I do a lot of work, not not just for Patriots on CLNS, but a lot of Celtic stuff as well. Uh, doing, uh, I'm the producer for Adam Kaufman's Celtic Speak, Good and uh, Plenty with Jeff Goodman. Yeah, by the way, two tremendous podcasts. Oh, they're fun. Jeff's a lot of fun to work with, and Adam and I have gotten to know each other pretty well. Uh, we've been cranking out great episodes there. Day, uh, I shouldn't, maybe I should do this. What does this drop? Drops Tuesday? 
Wednesday. I think it's dropping Tuesday, right, Mike? It drops Wednesday. Wednesday. Well, so by the time you listen to this, the newest episode of Good and Plenty will be out, and uh, uh, it looks it looks like to me, at least this is changes by three o'clock today. Uh, looks like uh, Jeff Goodman's going to sit down with David Griffin, former uh, GM of the Cleveland Cavaliers. So that should be kind of fun. Adam spoke with Chris Forsberg this last week, and of course, you can find me on Celtics Roundtable on CLNS Media as well. So appreciate the, the time, Mike. You know what? That's great pr- uh, cross pollination of clnsmedia.com. dot com. That is why you're so. What we a- do though? <laughs> it is what we do, and that's why you're a great part of the team. That's Evan Valenti of WBRK in Pittsfield, Mass, and also clnsmedia.com. dot com. Thanks again, everybody, for downloading today's Patriots Beat. Want to once again thank our guest Evan Valenti from WBRK in Pittsfield. You can also give us a follow at Patriots CLNS and at CLNS Media on Twitter. You can also give my own personal account a follow, of course, at Trags, T-R-A-G-S. Today's sponsor, 4 For Patriots content manager Mike Alonji, CLNS media executive producer Larry H. Russell, and the founder of the network, Nick Gelso, thanks to everyone who tuned in. This is Mike Petralia, and this has been the Patriots Beat Podcast, powered by CLNS Media.